So hello everyone. On behalf of Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage in TAC and the TAC Conservation Institutes, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker and everyone who has taken the time out to join us for today's talk in the Conservation Insights 2020 lecture series. I'm Dr. Kirina Roila, I'm the director with ICI DEN. Today is the second lecture with the collaboration with C University of Applied Sciences and Arts of Southern Switzerland. I'm extremely grateful to Professor John and our team for organizing these lectures. Now to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Francesca P.K. is Professor in Conservation Science at Supsi Institute of Materials and Construction. She's a wall paintings conservator trained at the Couture Institute of Art, University of London, and has an undergraduate degree in chemistry from the University of Florence and a master's degree in science for conservation from University of London. She has worked from 1991 to 2004 at the Getty Conservation Institute on several multidisciplinary projects, focusing on the conservation of wall paintings, bas relief, mosaics, and archeological sites. Since 2009, Professor P.K. is working at Supsi Institute of Materials and Construction and is responsible for the conservation restoration sector. In addition to teaching, she's involved in several conservation and research projects with a focus on the technical study, conservation, monitoring, and maintenance of built heritage. She's the author of three books and over 50 articles in professional scientific journals in the field of cultural heritage preservation. The title for today's talk, as we all know, is Before, During, and After, Scientific Investigation for the Conservation of Wall Paintings. So I now invite Professor Francesca Piki to start her presentation. Thank you, Francesca. Over here. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Padma Rohila, for uh, inviting me, and thank you, Jacinta, for Jacinta and Padma for organizing this uh, event. And today I will concentrate uh, on uh, the use of uh, a scientific uh, investigation and how we, how they are used in cultural heritage preservation. So my presentation before, during and after. And this is because we, I would like to uh, send a message which is about the fantastic tools that we have nowadays but we need to think about when we using these two tools what is the timing of our uh, investigations and uh, typically we imagine that we do uh, investigation before and especially in my country we often focus very much in what is the characterization of the materials which of course it's very important we must understand but we also need to remember that we need scientific support during the intervention and after the intervention over time and this is, of course, uh, very important when we deal with the type of heritage that we have at hand, which is immovable heritage, heritage that is characterized by being extremely uh, large, enormous, a thousand of square meters of surfaces, extremely different and heterogeneous in terms of the exposure, in terms of the painting technology. And I put a picture here of your wonderful site of uh, Ajanta, but there's many other sites in, in, in India, the Taj Mahal and others that are very good examples of uh, the, 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 the size of the heritage that we need to take care of. So as you heard, I, I teach uh, here at SUPSI and what we try to do in our uh, courses uh, where we are forming those uh, future conservators uh, uh, both in Switzerland and in, in Italy, you know, we're very close to the border with Italy. So our conservators, um, we form them to understand what are the potential of all the different tools uh, techniques that are available uh, in conservation 
But we also, and the most important part, is that they need to understand what is the question that they ask. So rather than starting from the tool that it's available, very important, focus on what is the question that you are trying to uh, answer. And uh, this question, um, when is it within the different parts that constitute a conservation project? So um, here uh, I'm going to show you some examples of some experience that I've had uh, in conservation. This is a close up of a beautiful 14th century uh, wall painting cycle in Florence that we uh, studied. It's a big project by the Opificio delle Pietre Dure that I was lucky to be uh, fortunate to be involved with. And this, for example, is one area uh, where you can see on the one hand the beautiful is almost a manual about fresco technique. So here the flesh tone of these ladies are in one fresco and the rest, uh, the vestment for example, are made in secco. So within this small area I have an extremely different type of uh, uh, technique. Uh, in, a, in addition to different types of uh, problems. And this is one part in a big large church. Here is the facade of Santa Croce in Florence. That's my hometown, so I'm happy to show you this. This is the interior, so enormous areas, enormous surfaces. This is the altare, the main, main altar. And here you can see the wall paintings that I was talking about. So this cycle by Agnolo Gaddi. And just the painting, if we consider the um, vertical walls and also the, app, the vault, uh, cover over 700 square meters of surface. So extremely uh, large um, and as uh, I illustrated before, it's desirable from one inch to the other. Before passing another example, I'd just like to point out a fabulous website by the OP feature where you can see a lot of links and a lot of information about the restoration and uh, the documentation of this site that you can, you can go and see later. But again, in the, in the coming a little bit closer to uh, our school, this is a site, uh, Villa Cicogna, uh, it's a site that it was a hunting lodge. Uh, our students, we have uh, our work sites here, and it's an example of the extent, again, of decoration. Here you can see on the external facades of the villa, you have wall paintings. They are in uh, not very good condition. This is because they are exposed to the element. So they have uh, uh, deteriorated perhaps uh, extensively uh, more than what we see inside. There are semi-confined wall paintings here on the vault. You can see they're in good condition. In the lower part, a little less. You can see examples of capillary rise and problems such as this. There are wall painting in the interior of the villa. So enormous, uh, uh, vast surfaces. So here again, the characteristics of these wall paintings that we have to deal with in our profession is that they're vast, they are porous material, typically plasters uh, are porous and heterogeneous surface. They're connected to the structure, they're connected to the environment and they are uh, typically um, always uh, exposed to processes and causes of deterioration. Another site where I work very much uh, was the Mogao Grottoes. This is uh, in the northwestern part of China. It's a very important UNESCO site that has several grottoes over almost 500 painted caves. Uh, this is an example of one, this is Tang Dynasty. And you can see the uh, vast uh, decoration and uh, both uh, on the walls uh, and on the sculptures. And the site uh, was, uh, uh, dates from the fourth to the 14th century. So there's almost a thousand year of Buddhist art. This is another 
uh, grotto, another style of painting is a very important site uh, uh, um, um, in China. And here's a view of the site uh, from far. You can see the cliff face. Uh, that arrow indicates where there is the nine story pagoda. And uh, the, there are almost 500 grottos. There's an estimate of 45,000 square meters of wall paintings. And this is an enormous number. And to figure, to, to visualize it, we can, you can imagine uh, a wall that is three meter high and it's 15, meter, 15 kilometers long, all painted. And that's why this site, as many other sites that you have in your country, we have, they really um, represent uh, the complexity of the problem and the need to adopt a systematic approach to uh, manage the sites and to conserve them uh, in the most effective way. And this includes the use of scientific support. So here in Mogao, the plasters are made of earth, they're earthen plaster, uh, beautifully painted with mineral and uh, natural um, organic dyes. Um, the problems that the site uh, uh, suffers from are very severe. There are problems that bring uh, loss of heritage. So here we have plaster detachment, we have uh, uh, flaking, and uh, all these problems that to, to address this problem in such a large site in an effective way, uh, we must uh, start by understanding the process. So understanding why, what are the causes of these problems, uh, what is the process that caused the deterioration that is active and that we see there? And this is where we need scientific support um, in addition to uh, conservation um, interventions. So this is where this brief introduction was just to give a sense of the enormous difference that we have uh, and the challenge that we face uh, us that we deal with immovable heritage, with an heritage that is exposed and that cannot be closed inside a glass vitrine. Uh, it's always uh, 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 exposed to problems. It's uh, uh, always uh, um, affected by uh, potential causes of deterioration and we need to use our resources in a wise manner. For this reason, the process, we adopt processes. There's a lot of charters. Uh, I'm gonna illustrate a process that uh, um, we deal with in SUPSI is essentially an adaptation of the Bura Charter. And the concept that conservation is not, is not limited to the intervention. Conservation is not simply going and reattaching the flakes. Conservation is a process, and in our immovable heritage is a process that must be ongoing. This is the most effective way to deal with conservation. It's also effective from the economical point of view, because everyone knows that to set up and do an intervention is very expensive, versus maintain a situation is much more economically favorable in addition to be much better for the object, for the heritage itself. So within this process, we imagine that we, we always have a preliminary part in which we gather the information about the site. And this is all the historical information, is the uh, information about uh, what happened, the physical history of the site, what happened over time. And with this information, we assess, uh, we assess the several parts, especially uh, us as conservators, we immediately look at condition. What are the conditions? What are the problems? But very important, obviously, is also assess the value, the significance, why this place is important. In this assessment part, uh, this is where we're gonna look at the 
problems. And in the planning phase uh, is when we're going to decide what can we do? What can we do both in terms of direct intervention and in terms of preventive intervention? Something that I can do on the side to ameliorate the situation, perhaps reduce the processes of deterioration. And after the planning, we're going to implement. This is where conservation itself, the remedial intervention directly on the object. Let's say the old fashioned idea of conservation was this, was the intervention. Um, but as uh, we are saying, this is not the only part. It's part of a cycle. It's part of a process. And once implement the um, conservation is implemented, it's fundamental to continue controlling how the conditions are and maintaining the site. So on the basis of what we learn, uh, uh, implement those regular maintenance operation or be ready to implement those extraordinary maintenance operations that are required because something is happening. And so this is an entire cycle, which we call the conservation process. And from this cycle is where I would like to uh, highlight this aspect, uh, the scientific support that we can, uh, so we're so lucky nowadays, we have an incredible scientific support, is important in this before part. So before I do the intervention, during the intervention and after, I'm going to use scientific support also to monitor, to maintain, to understand when I need to act. So all of this is uh, illustrated also was a big work was done by the Get in China. So there is the China principles. Uh, which are a derivative of the Bura Charter available on site. But all of these is to uh, illustrate where the scientific investigation take place in the conservation process. So we can see that in, the, in this preliminary part that you would have technological studies. Most, most typically, when we think about scientific investigation, we identify with, uh, let's characterize the pigments, which pigments were used. Yes, that's an important information, but I cannot only have that information. I need many other information. So technological studies are studies that allow me to understand better how the heritage was developed and what are the materials there. But in the assessment part, I will have to do diagnostic studies. These are very, fun, very important because they allow me to assess and, uh, the conditions understand the causes, understand the process. And this is what diagnosis means in, in, this is a medical term. I understand what causes my problem. And in the treatment, uh, I put it over here, I have treatment planning, I need to do tests, I need to evaluate a different type of uh, intervention. For example, what would be the best adhesive for a flake in this particular situation with this particular kind of substrate, which is in this particular kind of environmental context, which has had this particular uh, physical history. So all of this is very specific. The treatment is developed for the specific case. There's no universal treatment. There's no universal glues or consolidants that can be used everywhere. It's part of a process. And I use scientific investigation to develop and evaluate my treatments, to assess it as I'm doing it on site. And finally, I monitor the condition and the efficacy of the, of the intervention over time, also with scientific investigation. Uh, because nowadays tools are very, uh, simple to use, are not simple, are much more portable, and so we can really take advantage of the technology. So within this, uh, let's look at some example, um, as, let's look at, sorry, as, at the technology that we have. So as you know, we can nowadays divide very clearly the analytical scientific methods into big groups. The one non-invasive investigations are those 
tools, investigation that I can do on site, I can do without taking a sample, I can do in many, many different places without arming my object. Uh, and this is obviously is extremely advantageous when we're dealing with our large heritage. And uh, the other group is the invasive methods. So these are fundamental because they allow us to understand much more uh, about the materials and they do require taking a sample. But of course, sampling will be guided by the understanding of the non-invasive method. And the revolution nowadays that we have is really this, the, uh, the incredible improvements in the non-invasive methods. We have so many techni techniques that until 10, 15 years ago were only available in the laboratory that nowadays uh, have become portable, can go on site. And the huge advantage of this is that um, not only I can study all the different areas of my vast heritage but the enormous advantage is that the scientist or the conservation scientist can interact right there on site with the conservator and the conservator is the person that has been studied the site for the most the conservator is the person that has looked at that surface inch by inch for weeks, months, and he's trying to develop a, a solution, he's trying to find the best solution for this patient. And once the scientist and the conservator uh, get together on site, everything becomes much more effective. And uh, in my opinion, this is the most, the greatest uh, aspect about this non-invasive methods that uh, they really facilitate the multidisciplinary, interdisciplinarity of our field of conservation. Um, and there's been a lot of improvements. Uh, uh, here you see some uh, spectroscopic systems that uh, are now available on site. I can get some very uh, specific information. Uh, so we're talking about imaging techniques, point analysis, but we don't have time to go uh, I don't want to, uh, we don't have time for all of this in details, but you are aware of the incredible uh, uh, development. And in particular, we're arriving to level, this is, I think, the most incredible thing we can do nowadays. Uh, this is a system developed uh, by Giacomo Chiari at the Getty. We can do XRD, X-ray diffraction, and XRF on site. So this is really uh, sophisticated. But these tools, uh, uh, techniques that we have, they vary a lot. Um, sorry, here I'm showing you the, the diffractogram and the XRF uh, spectrum that this instrument can provide. But this instrument is an example of an extremely complex instrument. We have other instruments that are simpler that can be, that are becoming more and more the tool bag uh, of conservators. As young conservators, new training program uh, um, develop conservators which, which have a good understanding of the, the, the technology. We have systems that are more simple and can be adopted um, easier, also because from the economical point of view, they're less expensive. So uh, here is an example. This is the site of Ercolano, this is Vesuvian area near Naples. These are the Roman uh, cities that were covered by the uh, eruption of the mountain Vesuvio, which you can see here in the back. And this is a site uh, where uh, I've been working. And I just want to use this to show you example of a technique that is very simple, is an imaging technique related to photography, which is ray, raking light photography, which is extremely useful in several parts. So here you see the use before. So my lecture was before, during, and after. So before I can use uh, raking light photography, if you ex uh, look at these two images, to clearly identify the technique, for example, you can see the compass line all around this medallion, the terrible condition. So it's very useful like that. The same technique can be used 
to assess during my intervention. So I'm using raking light as I'm relaying down the flakes to see where it goes down. And the same technique can be used over time to assess stability. So we're talking about reproducible photography, being able to document after the intervention, after my conservation is finished, I'm gonna document very careful my surface. So I can compare in five years when I come back, I can see if a new type of, uh, if a new uh, problem has uh, shown, if it's uh, new or if I can see a steel from the picture uh, that I've taken at the end of the intervention. Another, as always with photography, technical photography, in this case, you see two images, invisible and UV light. Here again, I, we almost everybody now use UV radiation to illuminate and see areas that have fluorescence or rather luminescence. luminescence. Here, for example, you can see this beautiful um, panel drap uh, cloth uh, around this angel. And it would be wonderful to understand in detail what is the material, it's probably the binder of the um, paint layer that is causing the luminescence. However, even if I don't understand exactly what binder it is, this technique tells me that there is an area that it's delicate. We all know that organic materials are much more susceptible to treatment, especially cleaning. And so in this area, I need to be, pay particular attention. Uh, studies, in fact, you, you probably know, have shown that even water, which is considered a simple solvent, can uh, remove uh, organic materials from my binders. So cleaning needs to be uh, planned in a very uh, um, delicate way in areas of fluorescence. Here is another example of another site that, uh, again, was a, this was a work site with, uh, with Supsi. And here you see the extreme strong fluorescence of uh, uh, the zinc white. This is a material added during the um, uh, repainting. So this technique can help us also in this uh, identifying it and during the intervention to see exactly where it's problematic. Here we go back to China. Um, Padma before talked about someone giving a lecture about natural dyes, uh, organic uh, UV fluorescence here showed the strong fluorescence, for example, on the hollow of this bodhisattva here. And this uh, started a very large project on natural organic dyes um, used uh, in Asia, which was very important. But probably the most interesting use of UV fluorescence in China was on these little cartouches that can be found that describe the, the scenes that is de depicted. And here on the upper left is the visible light, on the upper right is raking light, you can see the problem of deterioration. The lower right is the infrared reflectance that sometimes is, can allow you to read underneath a paint layer. But the most interesting is here, the lower left. This is UV uh, induced uh, fluorescence. And you can see what with this, this technique allowed to read what's written on this cartridge, which of course was very important uh, uh, to emphasize uh, the significance uh, of these uh, paintings obviously for the Chinese, because I cannot read that, but very important discovery. Uh, on, a macro, on a mini scale, uh, portable microscopy, but I, I saw on your website that you're using this instrument, they're now becoming extremely uh, a part of the conservator uh, tool. And they allow us to read. Also in this case, we can use different radiation, visible, UV, there's also infrared radiation that can be used. In this case, uh, we were looking at this cross. It was possible to see clearly that it's overlapping and uh, the paint layer was clearly uh, helping identify the sampling, which was then done to find the, the component of this cross. This is again, uh, 
a site uh, in this part of the world, the Dolomitic area. So there's Dolomitic lime and it's not surprising that uh, magnesium carbonate salts are formed here. Another imaging tool, again, more and more available, more and more uh, um, affordable, because prices are also going down, is the infrared thermography. And this can be used before, as I'm showing you here, just to uh, inspect a structure to understand the areas that have been closed. Can be used to assess the uh, causes of deterioration. In this case, this is the facade, excuse me, of the Lugano Cathedral. So here, exactly in our town, uh, which is uh, decorated with the marble bust that you can see here, six of them, and stone everywhere. And the deterioration um, was studied also from the thermal point of view. So a study uh, at different times uh, was done to understand what is the heat uh, increase, the rate of heat increase, what are the temperature reached, and try to make this link with the type of deterioration that the marble are suffering. This information is important to understand uh, the, the, the deterioration process, but it's also very important to develop the intervention because my consolidant, my adhesive, what I need to use is a material that needs to be compatible with this environmental condition. It needs to be something that is uh, flexible enough and, and stable enough in this conservation, in this uh, climatic condition. This is an example uh, of thermography used during the intervention. In this case, we are in China. This is an area we're doing some tests. And the, the grouting, here we're doing grouting, the, you saw there were a lot of problems of delamination. Uh, so the thermography can be used, um, here's the thermo, thermo images, uh, to, to see where the grout goes. In this case, uh, the mixture had a little bit of a temperature difference. So through the earthen plaster, we could see the heat could pass through and we could clearly in, visualize it, as you can see here. Over time, we could see a cooler area due to the evaporation of the water in the grout. And uh, this image on the right is when everything is stabilized and so we know the intervention is completed. So this is just an example of tools that we can use during the intervention. Uh, after the intervention, we have tools such as a spectral colorimeter. This is typically um, used uh, to assess if uh, um, pigments perhaps are changing over time. We're working in this site in Varallo where we have a lot of uh, uh, cases where lead-based pigments uh, alter, uh, probably due, related to the humidity. And uh, there's been a lot of attempts of uh, reconverting the pigments back, but then they uh, alter again. And here is again another example of a tool that it's portable, it's not that expensive, and can help us manage uh, our heritage within the conservation process. So these were just some examples. I'm going to conclude my lecture with some few points. So I wanted really to clarify that uh, scientific investigation are fundamental. They're tools that are very uh, useful. They're improving more and more. They're becoming more accessible, more portable, but it's fundamental that the question uh, is formulated uh, that the tool needs to answer. So and this question is formulated with the conservator. Um, and uh, the fact that the non-invasive tools have improved enormously the, the dialogue between the conservator and the scientists. So we focus better on what is very important. The technology that we have, the scientific support, should be used when is necessary. So not only at the beginning, there's a lot of moments within the conservation process where I need scientific support. And unfortunately, it's very often that when the moment comes, for example, the conservators needs to develop its treatment, the funds for scientific investigation are no longer available. So it's very important that conservation budgets, the managers keep this in mind and allow the 
allow for the conservation program to have scientific support uh, um, in all the different phases. So in the before, in the during, and in the after the intervention. And so the, the uh, preservation of our immovable heritage, there is such a challenging task, can be ensured uh, through this uh, ongoing process. So um, I'm going to finish here. Just the last comment is that at the same time, we need to remember, we need to understand what incredible uh, uh, improvements we have, ha we've, we have had in our field. Because not many years ago, science was simply uh, relegated to a, a scientist coming on site, taking a few samples, going back to his laboratory and interpreting them. Where nowadays, the tools, the technologies that we have, our methodological approach allow us to really work in an interdisciplinary manner. So I'm going to finish with this uh, lovely bird from the archaeological site of Plontis, again a Roman and site. And I thank you very much for your attention. And I'm very happy to hear any comments, your experience, uh, and any question you might have. Thank you. And I'm going to stop sharing now. After where you go. On behalf of everyone, I think I'd like to thank Francesca for a very nice talk. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? I can hear you. We have, uh, thank you, Francesca. It was a lovely talk. I think very informative. We have a few questions. Um, I'll start taking them up. Uh, this is uh, Vijaya from Intac. She wants to know, does the infrared thermography harm the painting? If it's a painted surface, and are there any precautions that should be taken? Um, uh, I think uh, there should be, would be really great if you have a lecture about infrared thermography. Um, I know one of the students from the Cortal, I can't remember the name now, did an entire master thesis on this. But just to answer in two words, there are two, essentially two ways. That one is uh, the passive thermography. So this is like what I show you on the facade. I'm simply re registering the thermal emission. I'm not hitting the surface with anything. And another type of thermography, which uh, is used is by, it's called active. That's when I'm actively heating the surface and then I read how the, um, thermal behavior um, uh, occurs over time and in that case you can imagine that the heating can can be uh, can put uh, the surface in dangers as any heating would do okay. thank you but thermography is a extremely complex um, uh, technique and I think it would be advantageous to have someone that is very pro professional about it talk about it okay thank you uh, could you explain a little bit more, a uh, little more about the great susceptibility of areas with organic materials to interventions? How organic materials are more susceptible to interventions? Okay, so we can imagine that uh, wall paintings, if we look at wall paintings, stone monuments, we can imagine them made of two big groups of material. Now is my chemist nature that comes out. So one group is inorganic, so all what is minerals, uh, pigments, and one group is organic. So everything that is made like us, it's made of uh, uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. So generally, we can say, and we intuitively know, that inorganic material, stone, is strong. Stone res resists a lot. Organic material is much more susceptible to deterioration. Deterioration that can be related to physical interactions or through solvents. So as I was saying before, even water, water, uh, we showed through this organic material in wall painting project, we showed that water 
can take away protein material. So I can have a protein-based uh, uh, layer and it's uh, uh, dissolved, um, reduced, completely dissolved now, but reduced over time by simply water without a reagent. Then if you put a reagent, of course, the situation becomes even harder there. That, that will be a chemical interaction. So but one could talk for a long time about this, but essentially the, the, the identification of areas of fluorescence, like, like the one I showed you, uh, help you identify areas that have organic material. But what we have to remember is that in some cases, you could have organic material, but fluorescence doesn't show because there's other interactions. So, but also there, there could be a long lecture about this, the interaction of UV radiation with the painted surface. But in large terms, you can imagine that organic materials, so proteins, oils, uh, carbohydrates, uh, all the natural dye that you, that you mentioned are very susceptible to deterioration. These are the materials that deteriorate the most. When you come to see wall painting sites, um, typically what you see is what is left done in fresco technique. The seco part, typically because in the past there have been very harsh cleaning, you know, cleaning done with alkali and things like that, are all gone, most gone. So it's very sad that, uh, but nowadays we, we, we have techniques that allow us to understand where there are these materials and we can preserve it, we can protect them during cleaning. Cleaning is the most dangerous operation, as you, any conservator knows. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, somebody wants to know, portable microscope, affordable, any specification that you would recommend in case one wants to buy one? Uh, yeah, um, well, you know, there's for some reason, I mean, there's, the, the, there's this, this brand, and now I don't want to talk about brands, but there's a brand that everybody uses, but there's enormous amount of, of microscopes available on the market, really inexpensive, really, really inexpensive. What you need is to be able to record the image and to be able, ideally, to also have UV. However, if your microscope can switch off, you can have a UV lamp and you can, illust you can look at the fluorescence even with the UV lamp. So having a simple microscope like that, it's really not expensive. We bought, we had a large workshop at Supsi, um, and so we bought a bunch of microscope, which if I don't remember wrongly, were between 30 and 40 euro each. And they, they could record the USB. So look on internet, portable microscope, there's enormous type, really a variety of options. Now question, infrared thermography again, uh, can it actually tell us about the temperature distribution of surfaces and are the values of some particular materials predefined? So kind of Maybe if you know a temperature distribution, can you then identify the material with that? If you use no, not, not really, not at this level. Basically, um, the instrument measures the emissivity. As I said before, you need someone that talks to you about this technique uh, professionally, but we're measuring the emissivity. And through a coefficient that is specific per the different materials, so cement, metal, glass, plaster, uh, you, this, this emissivity is translated into temperature of the surface. So obviously when you look at a facade, uh, the facade I showed you, uh, most of it is made of one type of stone, some are marble, those big bosses, there's some other type of stone. So I should really have different emissivity everywhere. So just because different materials are there, I will see different temperatures. So it's a very useful tool to see, to do relative measures. So I can see in this situation, the sun is on and how much my temperature is raising, but not absolute measurements. And again, I, I can't remember, but perhaps I know there is a, a Eugenia uh, here. She, pr she probably remember who did uh, uh, the thesis on infrared thermography at the Cortal not long ago. Yeah, it was uh, Fiona Henderson. Fiona. So she would yeah. be the person that um, Padma 
yeah. you could invite mm -hmm. to, to really talk uh, in depth on, on this mm -hmm. technique, it's which is it's absolutely mm, very useful coming up and we, we use it a lot. But okay. Eugenia perhaps can send um, yeah, the link. Could. Yeah, please. Uh, here, there, there it is, perfect. I have sent her name. Okay, okay, Henderson, I got that, thank you. Um, the question is, uh, can you provide a little bit more details about the natural organic dyes in Asia project? Uh, okay, this is a, a project that um, was started basically in Mogao, we discovered this incredible use. By the way, there is this publication, which is uh, by the Getty about the Mogao wall paintings, and um, you can find some information there, but most information you find on the Getty website. So uh, the idea of that project was uh, um, to um, address the challenge of identifying organic dyes. You know, it's difficult to identify organic dyes, uh, but in any case, all the identification go through uh, a data bank, so a comparison. And we have a good data banks for European dyes, but there's really not a good data bank, or there wasn't a good data bank for Asian uh, uh, colorant. And so there was a very large uh, multidisciplinary project where uh, some historians look at the text to find out all the recipes and the plants where the dyes would come from. Uh, pr uh, then the dyes where uh, the plants were grow, the dyes were created, the dyes were analyzed. And at this point, the idea was exactly to develop a data bank so that you could compare when you do the measure uh, on site. You take a sample, for example, I show you those uh, the in the hollow, those uh, organic, those uh, fluorescent parts. They're all related to dyes. Those are dyes that visib visually uh, uh, are not visible anymore. They have uh, um, faded, they have faded, but their fluorescence uh, uh, remains, and this is very typical. That's why UV fluorescence is very, very useful when you when you look and when you do cleaning, because it allows you to see where to be very careful. Thank you. Uh, a question on uh, luminescent materials. Uh, can you make out whether luminescent material that you find may have been extracted from algae or aquatic animals? Can you differentiate the source? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Uh, do you think when you see luminescent materials in your studies, is it possible to identify whether they are from the algae or from aquatic animal sources? Okay, so um, these techniques that I showed you, like UV fluorescence, uh, they're very simple. Uh, and it's fantastic, we can use them a lot. But of course, the drawback is that they don't tell you very much. So the only thing you can tell is that this area is fluorescing. And as I said before, there, there could be organic material and is not fluorescing for other reasons. So areas that are fluorescing means contain some uh, fluorescing materials. Typically, but this depends, in wall paintings, these are related to the organic, the binder of the paint layer. But we all know that, for example, calcite, which is a mineral, has a very strong fluorescence, orange. Uh, zinc white, I show you an image. So there are also uh, inorganic material that fluoresce. And the question was about algae. And I think, so that's the reference to the fluorescence of the chlorophyll. So chlorophyll fluoresces in red. And so you need to link, and this is where it comes the interdisciplinary, you need to link what you see with the other information, the, the distribution of the phenomena um, to make an hypothesis. This hypothesis needs to be verified with other more sophisticated technique. But I, what I was trying to say is that for the fluorescence, when you see it the way I showed you in that angel, where you can see it's exactly uh, isolated and limited to one part of a clock. 
Because obviously the binder of that material is not only here, it's everywhere. So the binder is fluorescing and so most likely is in fact organic material. Now in that particular case, uh, we also went with portable FDIR and did analysis on those parts. And so we were able to confirm the presence of protein and lipids in that case. But just seeing the fluorescence, because portable FDIR is quite expensive, it requires an expert, it's not something that a conservator can do, um, but just seeing the fluorescence is enough to say, okay, you have to be cautious here. Thank you. Uh, a good book, people are asking for any good book for scientific investigation of paintings. A reference, a good reference that could probably lead or anything that you can recommend, any writing, reading material that you would recommend? Um, you probably all know that at the, at the Getty Conservation Institute, there is enormous amount of publications free online. Uh, they are in PDF. You can download a lot of them. Um, so now um, I, Padma, if it's okay, I, I would rather make a list and send it to you because now right off of my head. Um, no, 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 no. But for no, sure, I'm, I'm, I put sure on the record. That's an, a resource that should be take advantage to. Uh, there's also just recently an excellent publication on luminescence that has just come out. This is uh, the uh, Polytechnic of Valencia. That's again open science, open source, so you can go download it and use it. Um, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of information online and investigations. Uh, um, there are a lot of books that talk about the techniques. What I was really trying with my presentation is to put, put the emphasis, yes, on the techniques, but most on the questions and, and make sure that you have the resources to, to answer the important questions. Okay. Thank you, that will be very nice. Maybe next time we can put it there for everyone to see the references. Yep. Uh, then uh, and what so the publication, sorry, let me just write this down, is about, uh, um, you're interested in publication books on? Scientific investigation. Okay. What are the methods, scientific investigations for paintings? Um, then we have a question. What type of consolidation generally used for wall paintings? Uh, in your case, what do you normally use for consolidation of paintings? We don't use anything normally because there's no normally. Every case is different. Think about medicine. Would you like to go to your doctor and be told, oh, your arm hurts, just take this. Okay, in medicine, we do this a little bit. But we are pretty much very, very similar, all of us humans. We're all made of stone, not stone, <laughs> we're all made of bones and flesh. We have blood. So we are much more similar than heritages. And so it's very important to go away from recipe. There's no consolidation that is good. You need to consider what is the problem, what is the cause of the problem? Were you able to remove the cause of the problem? Or you need to consolidate so that your consolidation is compatible with this cause still ongoing? This is a fundamental question. So there's no way that I can answer what consolidant would you use? Enough, thank you. Uh, are there any more questions? I don't see any in the chat. I would like to thank you all because I know that it's late uh, uh, and that you probably want to go back to your families and, and, to, and to have dinner, but it's, um, it's a, pleas a pleasure to talk to you. And Padma, I really would like to be in touch in terms of listening to other presentations of case studies. Sharing all the invites, sending the invites as well as the uh, links. And uh, no, no more questions. Everybody's thanking you. So from all the participants. You're from, very welcome. From a very, very a big thank you from us and to 
you and um, Jachinta as well. Thank you so much. Our next lecture is on the 16th. Yes, so, uh, just in a few days, uh, next uh, Tuesday. Uh, I'll be sharing the links, no problem. I'll be sending an invite out and you can probably forward it to various departments and would like everyone to join us like this lecture. I mean, it's interesting if people do join from